your notebook, lesson 45, I think I heard Wayne say a few minutes ago, that's page 46. Uh, so chapter 20 of the Revelation. <clears throat> I'll read a little bit of scripture from that chapter here in just a few minutes, but got a lot to talk about in the introductory part of this chapter. What we're going into now is looking at events that will follow the end of the tribulation uh, and the battle of Armageddon. Um, we talked about Armageddon in our last couple of studies. And so now we're moving forward. We have some additional events that we're going to talk about. And these events will cover our next uh, three lessons, as a matter of fact, uh, through lesson 47. Uh, several things that, that with a lot of detail, hopefully that will help us with our understanding. This is a, a tremendous chapter really in the Bible. Most people probably do not think of it that way, but it is a very, very uh, exciting chapter, yet a sad chapter because there's some things like the great white throne judgment that we will talk about in this chapter that does not bring a lot of excitement to us when we uh, mention that, but we will be talking about that just a little bit later on. I will tell you up front <clears throat> that this can be a very controversial chapter uh, with people as you get into discussions about the revelation because everybody don't see the same things that I see. I don't see the same things that they see. And you may not see the same things that I see, or you may not see the same things that other people see, but hopefully we will all agree together. Or at least, as you hear me say, often we'll agree to disagree and still love one another. Uh, that's, that's important. The reason that there's so much disagreement about this particular chapter is because it mentions the term or the phrase a thousand years. Matter of fact, if you count the number of times it's mentioned in this one chapter, I think you'll find six times a thousand years is mentioned. Six times that it is mentioned. Because of the different views about the thousand years, then that gets us into uh, the introductory part of this lesson to explore some of the different points of view with regard to the 1,000 years that is mentioned here. Now, basically, there are three lines of thinking, but depending on who you read after, you may come across, if you like to read commentaries and so forth on the Revelation, when you get to this point and the discussions on chapter 20, you may find a whole lot of additional points or sub points that's made with regard to uh, what folks believe about the thousand years that are mentioned here. Um, John Walford in his commentary goes into quite a bit of detail uh, about many different views or uh, parts of the views, but it basically comes down to, as J. Dwight Pentecost said in his book on things to come, four views. And I bring that down further to say basically three views uh, with regard to what we're going to be talking about here in this chapter. Uh, the reason Pentecost says four is because he adds in uh, a view that he refers to as being the non-literal or the spiritualized view. That means simply that uh, the, the terms, the term 1,000 years and so forth is converted into a spiritual meaning rather than looking at it uh, from a literal perspective and taking it for what uh, we read the Bible to be saying. 
and I'll say more about that in just a minute. But, but basically, don't want you to get tangled up on that word spiritualized because it just means, for the most part, that people who do that don't take this passage of Scripture literally. They do not believe that it says what I think it says and what I believe it says. So they try to uh, make it say other things, and they say that the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ that we've already talked about, uh, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, has already been fulfilled in the past. It was done. It was fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Uh, or there are those that would take that view and say, well, that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Others say that is fulfilled whenever a person is converted or saved from their sins and so on. Uh, and there are people who try to explain away what the Word of God really says. So um, I just caution you to be aware of that, to know that the spiritualization of a passage of Scripture like this is a prominent teaching by some, hopefully fewer than more, but uh, depending on which commentary you read, and I read a number of them uh, as I prepare and study for teaching the lesson. Uh, there's a lot of people who subscribe to that view. But for me, it basically comes down to three points of view. And I've mentioned these earlier in our study. And I think if I remember correctly, I told you that we would come to a point where we would look at these points of view in more detail. So here we are. We're at the point where we're going to look at them in more detail. There are, uh, as I call them, three schools of thought. These are beliefs about this particular chapter that we are getting ready to study that are based on, and I'm going to use a big word here, and uh, then, then try to just boil it down to simple terms so you'll understand it but it's based on one's view of eschatology. What in the world is eschatology? That's a big word. Uh, eschatology is the study of the end times. Um, and so as you study the revelation and you study the prophecies of Daniel and so forth, uh, you're studying eschatology. We are studying eschatology and we derive our own point of view uh, generally in association with the three schools of thought. The first one is the school of thought that carries the name of amillennialism. Amillennialism. Amillennialism is, as I understand it, probably the newest of the three schools of major thought and like I say, don't uh, if you're reading the commentary and you get into various levels of these three major thoughts, don't be surprised by that um, because there are a lot of different tangents that some people go down. But I'm going to just hit the high spot at the at the top of the of the heap, so to speak. And so <clears throat> this. This point of view spiritualizes the 1,000 years, much like Pentecost was talking about with the non-literal point of view or the spiritualized point of view, but we can define it just a little bit better by the use of the word amillennialism. Now, the folks who subscribe to this, and thankfully, as I... Uh, understand it these days, the numbers of the folks uh, that believe in, uh, in this particular point of view is shrinking because the passing of time has proved them wrong. God has a way of making that happen, doesn't he? Sometimes. Passing of time has proved them wrong. You see, folks who have subscribed to this, and I've encountered these points of view uh, throughout my almost 50 years of ministry. 
I encountered them back in my young days, whenever I first started out, even before I uh, surrendered to preach the gospel, I was encountering these points of view and learning about them. And then whenever I entered Bible college, I began to learn more about them and was convinced by the Holy Spirit through my studies of the scripture, um, the point of view that, that I identified with and I've already told you what I identify with, so I won't surprise you when I get there in a minute. But uh, the folks who subscribe to amillennialism uh, do not believe that the Lord is going to return to earth and establish a reign uh, for a thousand years. What they have subscribed to is a belief in the past that uh, human history would be completed in about 6,000 years. Now you understand why I said that with the passing of time, they've been proven wrong because we're beyond 6,000 years, right? We know we're beyond 6,000 years already. And they subscribe to the idea that uh, human history would, would span that period of time and then that 1,000 years that is mentioned here would be added on to that, but as they took it not to be a literal 1,000 years, they said that's going to be the eternal state. And that's not the case. There is no biblical foundation for that at all. Uh, what they have also subscribed to is that as they've tried to spiritualize this is that the church uh, would be the, the means or the mechanism through which God would fulfill all the prophecies concerning his kingdom and that Satan would be bound when Christ came the first time when he was born into this world. Satan would be bound at the first coming or was bound, so they said, at the first coming of Christ. And then this present age went forward with the Lord working through the church and so forth, and the church not going through the tribulation period, but moving right on into the uh, eternal state, uh, being the 1,000 years, but not a literal 1,000 years, being the eternal state. Now, I hope I've made that about as clear as mud. Uh, hopefully you understand uh, that point of view just a little bit better. <clears throat> the second point of view that I bring to your attention that hopefully you have heard about, I hope that what I'm sharing with you is not brand new information tonight, but the view that we refer to as being uh, <coughs> post-millennial, post-millennial. Um, that school of thought believes that uh, the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ that we just studied about in the 19th chapter of Revelation will not occur until after uh, the millennial kingdom reign here upon the earth. Hence the terminology post-millennial, that these things will occur after the millennial reign here upon the earth. In order to make that view work, those people have subscribed through the years to the belief that there would be one general resurrection, one general judgment, and the church would not be raptured out of this world, but the church would go through the tribulation period and experience the tribulation period. Then the millennium, it would move right into the millennium. The millennium would take place. And then at the end of the millennium, Christ would return. Um, now, based on what I've already taught thus far in the Revelation, none of that makes any sense, does it? Uh, can you easily, hopefully you can easily see that that doesn't make any sense. Uh, what they also have subscribed to is the belief that the gospel will be triumphant during the last 1,000 years of this present age. And... For most of those that have subscribed to the post-millennial belief, they believe that's still future. Um, but 
that belief has been shattered in great measure with the passing of time because of the fact that as you and I now know, historically speaking, there have been two world wars. There was a major depression that occurred in the 20th century that uh, our grandparents and uh, uh, maybe parents, I'm talking about myself, my grandparents came through that period. My dad and mom was uh, too young to know a whole lot about uh, that particular period of time, the depression years and so forth because of uh, the time frame when they were born. But uh, your parents, my grandparents, or your grandparents remember those days and how horrible they were. And uh, because of those three major events, not to mention other things that have occurred, that's caused a lot of people to abandon this point of view about the, uh, or this belief of being a post-millennial uh, interpreter of the scripture. Leads me to the third one then that's major in terms of what we look at, and that is premillennialism. <clears throat> and I've already told you very early in our study that I'm not ashamed of the fact that I uh, am a premillennialist. Um, all of the studies that I have done and the way the Holy Spirit has led me and convinced me about what is being taught in His Word uh, has led me to uh, definitely subscribe to the premillennial point of belief. This school, and I'm one who's a part of it, this school believes that Revelation 20 must be interpreted literally. It must be taken as it is written and understood that the events that are outlined, and depending on how you outline them, Schofield has them, I think, outlined as five major events. I outlined them as four, and you'll see that as we go through. But these four or five major events occur in chronological order after the Battle of Armageddon has occurred and Christ has returned with his saints to the earth. Chronological order, chapter 20. All of that's necessary, I think, for us to look at. So what, what I believe is that Christ returns and what the premillennial point of view believes and the document that you have in your notebook that I drew up, the pictorial uh, document that you have, that you unfold there, the chart, if you will, you notice at the top it says, and I put that there purposely, a premillennial uh, point of view with regard to uh, the end times. That view and the view that I have believes that Christ returns at the end of Daniel's 70th week, which is at the end of the tribulation period, as I've already articulated it to you. It means that sin is subdued, Christ becomes the victor, Satan is removed, and then everything is ready for the, the Lord to establish himself as the king of kings and rule for a literal 1,000 years here upon the earth. Matthew 24 talks about this time period. Now, one thing I need to point out that I think is paramount here to understand, there can be no kingdom here upon the earth until the king returns. Everybody agree with that? How can there be a kingdom if there's no king here? And if he doesn't return till the end of the millennium, as the post-millennialists say, then how in the world can there be a millennial kingdom reign here upon the earth? Who's going to be in charge? Because he will be the king of kings and he will be the supreme one who rules for 1,000 years. So that leads me to say this, that the premillennial point of view fully subscribes to the fact that the 1,000 years that 
is mentioned here in this passage of scripture is to be treated as 1,000 years. It is a literal period of time that God has designated for this particular purpose. Um, so I think it is best for me personally to subscribe to the fact that a thousand years means a thousand years. God said through John what he meant to say. He said exactly what he meant to say. He didn't mean for it to be spiritualized or symbolized in any way. He meant for it to be understood the way it really is. So all of the events that we have stated about thus far have been premillennial events. Premillennial, meaning that these events that we just finished talking about in chapter 19 have all occurred before the kingdom reign of the Lord here upon the earth during this 1,000 year period. So what we're getting ready to study are millennial events. Millennial events. That's why it was so necessary to go through all of that to help us to understand. And you're going to find that this chapter is going to be absolutely amazing as we break it down and as we talk about the millennial time frame here upon the earth. Um, and again, I just remind us that the events that we're going to start talking about are in chronological order. John says in verse 1 of chapter 20, And I saw an angel come down from heaven. Here's a familiar uh, set of words that we carry over from chapter 19 into chapter 20. And I saw. He's telling us exactly what he is enabled to see. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon and that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. There's our first mention of it. Bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years, there's a second time it's mentioned, should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a short season. There's a lot of material there, but it won't take me long to cover it and wear you out here tonight. So these three verses tell us that the first event now, following the victorious defeat of uh, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all of the armies of the world by the Lord that we've already described for you, here's the next event in order moving into the millennium. That is the binding or the removal of Satan, taking him out of the picture altogether. You know, <clears throat> you've heard me talk about this and you've heard me talk about him being an adversary. There's no question about the fact that he's, he, Satan, has been the personal enemy of God and mankind from the very beginning of man's history here upon the earth. He was the one that deceived Eve and caused her to partake of the forbidden fruit. And she gave it to Adam, offered it to him and asked him to partake of it. And he partook, he partook of it. And thereby, all mankind were plunged into and under the condemnation and penalty of sin. Hopefully we understand that. And that's very clear in our hearts and minds. Satan is responsible for that. The devil himself is responsible for that. And so from the beginning, he is a murderer. He's a liar. He's a cheat. He's a thief. He's a slanderer. He's a deceiver. You just keep on using all of the adjectives that you want to use to describe him. My grandfather, as I've told you before, called him that old bird. And he said, I'd be glad when the day comes that that old bird is taken care of and removed out of the way. Well, here it is. The old bird's going to be removed out of the way. And uh, he's no longer going to be uh, causing the problems that he has caused. And so in order for righteousness and peace to rule here upon the <coughs> earth, Satan must be removed. How else? 
is righteousness and peace going to be uh, manifested uh, the way God wishes for it to be manifested here upon the earth. Now, the world uh, has a different view probably than what I have or what you have about what's going on these days and certainly a different view from what God has of the world as we know it now. Uh, we're in a mess, right? Uh, I don't know how many people I've talked to just in the last few days. Uh, I think of a preacher that I talked to uh, just a handful of days ago. Others that I've talked to, I talked to a guy today that called me on the phone and talked with me for some time. He said, you know, Joe, this world is in a mess. And I can only say, absolutely, I agree wholeheartedly. This world is in a mess. And we didn't get into this mess overnight. And without the Lord's help, we're not going to get out of it overnight. Um, that's just not going to be the case. Our world has a different view of what's going on. People in our world have a different view. Even leaders in our own country stand up these days and say, we've got the best economy, we've got the best conditions that we have ever had. And I'm sitting there on my couch saying, what a lie. How deceptive can anybody be uh, saying such things as that? Because we have problems. We have major problems. A lot of people in our world today say that our environment is to be blamed. Our educational system is to be blamed. The changes over the course of time are to be blamed. Um, all the while, while there are those who would like to have us believe that things are getting better, I must tell you, as you well know, I'm not telling you something you don't already know, but in accord with what Paul told Timothy, things are getting worse and worse. Evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse. And that's what we're witnessing. Those who stand up and say, we're doing better and we're going to get better. And next year is going to be better than this year and so on and so forth. Uh, cannot be trusted because I know what the good book says and you know what the good book says. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God. Proud, boasters, deceitful, despisers of those that are good. And the list just goes on. Paul talked about that in Timothy. And so the reason all of that is taking place is that the world's problems, while the world doesn't realize it. I'm here to say upon the authority of God's word and say it warmly and humbly, compassionately, but the world's problems all rest upon the shoulders of the devil. That's where it all rests. For he has blinded the eyes of multitudes. So many in this world have their eyes blinded he is the arch enemy of God, doing everything that he can to op uh, oppose God and oppose the people of God. And we're becoming fewer and fewer in number as our ranks are diminishing. And people are becoming more and more afraid to stand for truth. As people around us are departing from the truth. Beloved, we have got to take a stand in these last days. We must. I say we must, we must, we must. For if we don't, what in the world is going to happen to the younger generation that's coming behind us? And unfortunately, I don't have a room full of youngsters out of the next generation sitting here listening to me teach this lesson. But I would to God that I did. I would to God that I did because they need to know and they need to hear. They need to hear. Here's the good news. I can stay on that for a good while right there and keep going down that road, but here's the good news. The time is going to come when it will be time for Satan to go. And here it is. 
That's the good news. This will be the time for him to go. What man has been unable to do, God will now do through his appointed agent. And he sends an angel who comes down from heaven. And that angel has the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain is in his hand. Now just picture that in your mind, if you will. <clears throat> The question becomes one of, okay, can we identify the angel? Uh, all I know is John says, I saw an angel. And for me to go beyond that, personally, would be to speculate. But I will tell you that others have speculated. Some have said that it's the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't necessarily accept that nor subscribe to that because the Lord has just come in the revelation. He's here on earth. He could be the one that does it, but it seems that he chooses to use an agent to bind Satan at this particular time. And some have suggested that that might be Michael. Could be. But we do know that this event was prophesied by Isaiah chapter 24, verses 21 and 22. And what we find here is that this agent of God is going to be empowered to do seven things. And I'm not going to take a long time to give you those seven things. They're, they're listed for you here in verses 2 and 3. Um, He's going to have the power to open the bottomless pit. He's going to lay hold on Satan. He's going to bind the old serpent with a chain that cannot be broken. Now, I like to envision this in my thought process, that wild imagination that I was telling you about the other, the other evening. I like to think about this angel of the Lord having this chain in his hand and using it like a rope and he's whirling it right here as he heads towards Satan and that chain just locks around him and just wraps him up. And he can't move. He can't do anything. Boy, I like that, don't you? I really like that. He just cannot move. He can't move his arms. He can't open his uh, stride or steps to go anywhere. There he is, totally bound with this great chain. And after he's bound with this great chain, he is taken and he is cast into the pit and the door to that pit is shut and a seal is set up on it when all has been done. And this same agent will loose him out of this bottomless pit after 1000 years. And you'll have to wait to understand more about that. Uh, as we go forward in our study. Uh, now, while my imagination described that chain to you, is it a literal chain? I have no reason to think that it's not. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. I don't know. I just know that the Bible says he had a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the old dragon. And whatever it is that he uses, it's sufficient to do the job that God wants it to do. And so here he is taken and he is cast into the bottomless pit. Now, is that the same place where the Antichrist and the false prophet are? Anybody want to venture a guess? Anybody agree with Brother Rex over here? I do. Amen. <laughs> it's not the same place. <laughs> the Antichrist and the false prophet were cast into the lake of fire. Remember? The devil's going to have to await his turn for being cast into the lake of fire. Here he is cast into the bottomless pit, and here he, has, he is incarcerated. That's the, probably the best word to use. Where he has no way of escape because he is sealed there in that place, shut up, and a seal is set upon him for a particular purpose. It is stated that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years has run their course. Um, 
This bottomless pit is the place of the what we would call the house of demons. It's the abyss that uh, we read about in the scripture. And here Satan is going to be restrained. Um, and all of his uh, evil charades and efforts and so forth uh, will be no more. But this will not be his eternal punishment. This will be where he will be held in prison, so to speak, for 1,000 years. 1,000 years. And then after that, he must be loosed for a short season. Like I said a few minutes ago, we'll come back to that as we get on further in chapter 20 and understand why that takes place. Um, but there we have the first three verses and uh, the first of the four or five major divisions of the 20th chapter. Next week, we're going to talk about this uh, great event of uh, the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus. It'll be a wonderful lesson, so hopefully you can join us when we do that next week. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for the attentiveness of everyone, and I uh, am thankful that the day is out there in the future whenever our adversary is going to be bound and cast into the bottomless pit. Uh, we will not have to deal with him uh, anymore, and there will be perfect peace as you reign in perfection here upon this earth. But there's more that we need to understand about that and more that we hopefully will be uh, able to learn through the Holy Spirit's leadership in the next two or three weeks as we continue this all-important study. To you be the glory through that which is done, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.